This episode of the Brutally Speaking Podcast is sponsored by Podcorn. What is Podcorn? Podcorn is a marketplace that connects podcasts like this one with businesses of all kinds looking to raise the awareness of their brands through ad reads, interview segments, and more. I recently came across Podcorn and thought their idea of matching businesses looking to advertise on shows like this one was too good to be true, but quickly found that the site was very easy to use and was able to browse companies that I thought would fit the interests of our listeners. I've also come to love Podcorn's transparency when dealing with potential advertisers. Being able to set your own rates and having a variety of brands with a clear-cut idea of who they want to target and what they're looking for helps alleviate the stresses of sending countless blind emails in the hopes that someone will reply. All of this and there are no middle people to deal with and you don't have to give up any of the rights to your show. So huge thanks to Podcorn for sponsoring this episode of the Brutally Speaking Podcast. Explore a wide array of sponsorship opportunities yourself and start monetizing your podcast by signing up today at podcorn.com slash podcasters. Now on to the show. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Brutally Speaking Podcast, the official podcast of MetalNexus.net, where you can get all your show reviews, concert photos, and the latest going-ons and remembrances of the rock and metal world. And with me, as always, is Daniel Terry. How are you doing this evening? I'm doing pretty good. I'm a little perplexed if remembrances is a word. Uh, I mean, it is now because it's official, but uh, yeah, that one threw me off a little bit. Isn't that uh, that place in the mall? Remembrances. Things remembrances? (laughs) I'm not sure. I haven't been to a mall in like four years, so. Oh, okay. Well, you're missing out. The last time I was in a mall, I worked there, and I was selling calendars at a kiosk. Oh, I did that once. It sucked. It was not fun. No, especially when you knew everyone was just going to wait until like the day after the new year, and they're like, okay, now these are like half price. And that day's hell on earth. You ever had someone return a calendar? That's real embarrassing. (laughs) We didn't offer returns, not for people's lack of trying, but uh, yeah, that was always a fun conversation. They're like, can I return this? No. Well, yeah, but can I just return it? No, I I meant what I said the first time. (laughs) (laughs) Um, This episode's guest, if you haven't looked at your screen, is Andrew from the Ghost Inside slash One Decade. Uh, This is a fun one. Uh, Andrew and I have been uh, trying to do this for a while, and uh, I don't know if anyone's been aware of this, but the Ghost Inside are back, and they've been playing shows. So I had to deal with uh, him going to Australia and doing some other stuff and uh writing a new record um so we finally had a weekend where he was home and didn't have any plans so i jotted up to uh up to his house and sat across from him and did this conversation and uh it's interesting i haven't gone to someone else's house to do an interview usually if i go do an in-person it's it's at a venue so i think this is the first non-venue in-person chat i've done that's kind of fun. He had you in his lair. It's weird, too, that you felt comfortable enough to tell him that if you ever became a T-1000, you'd have to put him down. I told him I'd say a T-800, too, and I, I know someone's going to get me on that. Yeah, probably. But, I mean, it is one of those things where, uh, you know, you just have to be chilling on somebody's couch to really, um, to, to, to just feel comfortable enough to, add, to to make a statement like that. Well, it was just kind of fun, because, uh, you know, I don't know that a lot of people know about One Decade, and it was kind of out of the blue and you know we, we do end up kind of discussing this in the conversation but one decade basically was the first bit of music to come out from anyone from the ghost inside and i don't know if it's what people were expecting it to be and the thing that was kind of interesting to me is you know with it being an instrumental record you know i know that's not necessarily some people's thing but sometimes especially from you know as andrew said like he's not gifted in the vocal department <laughs> um do everything else do can fucking mix master play guitar play drums do all this other shit but uh all that aside you know it was what he wasn't saying it's what he was playing that kind of really spoke to me uh and the the instances of what he went through um that were coming out in the music that always kind of really intrigued me and, and made me want to talk to him about this record. And I honestly expected so many avenues to hit him up to do press about that record and was pleasantly surprised to see pretty much no one doing anything about it other than just, you know, like, you know, PRP and so forth being like, Hey, Andrew from the ghost inside dropped this instrumental record. And that was about it. 
Yeah, and they're underselling it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, like by by a mile. Because um, I didn't really check it out until I started listening to this interview. To be totally honest, and uh, it's pretty cool. Yeah. And I mean, that again, that's me underselling it as well. But like, I don't want to say too much about it because you guys really get into it uh, during the interview. And uh, dude, that interview was. Uh, I think one of my favorites so far this year, just because of how deep it got and like how you guys just really seem to connect uh, over a lot of the themes that were present. It's uh, it's something when listening back to it, I, I almost did that thing that I've done and do quite a bit where I feel like I've, I've bared too much of myself and I want to pull it back and make it more about the guest. But in this situation... I felt that doing that would be disingenuous to the conversation that we both had because we're both sharing things about our lives that we each went through to to have this common bond over some of the things that we've gone through that other people won't. Obviously, Andrew, to a way more extreme than I, but that doesn't invalidate either of our experiences. And I thought that it would be kind of disingenuous to, to pull myself out of that a lot more because I, I felt insecure for being so vulnerable when Andrew's literally sitting across from me in his own home, sharing, you know, his experiences firsthand with me and with all of us that as you'll hear. And, uh, it, it feels kind of weird. It, it makes me feel kind of naked, uh, in a sense. And I, the one thing I hope people take away from it is that I'm not trying to not necessarily one up Andrew and what he went through. But I, like I said, I just want people to understand that like I connected with the music in this album from the one decade coma visions record because of the experiences I went through as a child, you know, having a lot of surgeries and spending a lot of time in hospitals and so forth. And I genuinely do think you'll understand that that's, that's why he and I connect so instantly kind of because of the music and what he went through creating this thing it's kind of that thing that we always talk about when we why we love doing podcasts is because we love music so much and it makes us feel a certain way and uh I th- you know i i think it's it's really gratifying to hear you say that you really like this chat because i was kind of nervous because i know a lot of people are probably like you dan where they maybe don't know this record exists or haven't really given it a fair shake and i'm kind of hoping maybe that changes once they listen to this this conversation well yeah and i'm there was even stuff in there that like i haven't experienced um obviously i've never been put into a uh into a um into a medically induced coma uh but you know, it, I think I think we can all draw like like when you guys were talking about like how it made you feel, especially especially what you said, John, about how like man, I just fell asleep, and now a nurse is coming in to check my vitals. Like that is that 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 awakens something in me, you know, from when I was a little kid. I and I don't know if I've ever mentioned this on the podcast, but I had like a really bad head head injury as a kid, um, and uh, I'll just get it out of the way now. Yes, that explains a lot. Um, <laughs> But uh, it explains why I don't like Pantera, you know, like a hundred percent because I'm Ugh. not right in the head. But uh, it was really bad. Like my skull was my skull was fractured uh, in several places, and um, so I I spent some time uh, in the hospital. Um, I you know I had like a bone that had like a, a skull fragment that had actually entered my brain at one point, and it was like really scary. And I remember the doctors telling my par- well, I don't remember it. I don't remember a whole lot from that. Uh, but what I do remember so that and that that's my whole point is that like I don't remember a lot from that experience. But when you guys were talking about it, and then I listened to the song in question, it was like very. I was like, wow, yeah, I, like I, I kind of remember that. Like it that that feeling that it creates that 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 super like septic feeling of being in a hospital for an extended period of time and um even even more recently when i was in the hospital for uh you know it was well i'll just say it, it was like i was on suicide watch this is several years ago anybody that cares i'm doing fine now but uh <laughs> it was it was a bad deal and i remember it being the same thing that i had been awake for like 72 hours at that point and i couldn't fall asleep because every time i every time i would try to relax somebody would come in and interrupt me and it was just like this endless cycle and so like that that really affected me and then whenever i went into it and you guys were talking about it i was like oh i can't relate i can't relate and then suddenly i was like no <laughs> i think this is this is almost kind of universal for people that have been in that situation like i said i think he had it worse than the both of us you know maybe combined but um like it, it got really intense there, and and I think that that's what really drew me to it is that like you guys were super honest 
and and upfront about it. And I think you know a lot of the times with this type of music, people aren't necessarily as up to talking about their feelings or or like the atmosphere that it creates. You know, like because we come from a scene where everybody's just like, "Yeah, man, I wrote this because it sounded super brutal <laughs> or super genty or or we were just trying to do the most extreme thing ever." Whereas, you know, I definitely enjoyed this approach to music where, you know, you don't have vocals, you don't have lyrics, but you ha- but you're left with a, with a feeling, um, and maybe you can't always put your finger on it. Maybe you can like, um, and I thought it was really cool too, that, you know, and you guys just being two guys talking and relating, he was like, wow. Yeah. Like I, I'm so, it's scary to hear you say that because that's exactly the kind of feeling I was going for. <laughs> whenever i recorded it and i was just like oh man that's <laughs> hit it right on the hit the nail right on the head yeah yeah sometimes i i don't know sometimes i wish uh the experiences that kind of led me to those conclusions that i i didn't have or that either of us had to have gone through those obviously but uh i don't know i think uh i think it's time to stop talking about it and just uh get into it so yeah it's a long one yeah, this is my conversation with Andrew uh, of The Ghost Inside in One Decade, and we will uh, talk to you on the other side of it. Well, um, we've teased this long enough. I'm getting to sit across the table. This feels very uh, medieval timesy. I like it. I or, like the vibe. I, I guess maybe even a business presentation of sorts. But uh, sitting here in Andrew uh, from the Ghost Inside's house, we have been long talking about talking about his band One Decade. Uh, if you're not familiar with the record, Coma Visions came out about two years ago now. Yep. And um, yeah, I really love this record. So... Interestingly enough, um, I don't think a lot of people knew that you play guitar. <laughs> yeah, um, pretty pretty unknown fact that I've actually played guitar longer than I played drums. That was my first love was guitar. But I've been, you know, even when I picked up drums and that became my, you know, more prominent instrument of choice, I still played guitar and loved writing and recording things. So uh, yeah, I've I've like always kept up with it the same as actually. It's funny because. I like really never played drums at home off tour. I would play guitar. Like I never had a setup where I lived at the time or whatever to play drums and be loud all the time. So <laughs> literally the only time I played drums was like when we would practice before tours or be or on tour, like playing shows. That's the only time I would play drums. Other than that, I just play guitar. So the interesting thing about that, when I, when you put out the record, obviously the um, circumstances of, of, it being the first music post, uh, seemingly uh, post uh, your accident that you guys were involved in, um, as you talked about on the uh, previous podcast you were just on, which I'll link in the show notes. Um, you know, a lot of this music you had been working on for about a decade from the initial iterations, correct? Yeah, sort of, um, and and sort of like unintentionally. It's just kind of like it's it's sort of it was a thing where I would go and and just do whatever the hell I wanted with no other cooks in the kitchen kind of thing and just have complete creative freedom. And I would write even like back when I was still in for the fallen dreams, I would write stuff not for, um, for the fallen dreams, just stuff that I thought was cool and fun. Like, you know, more heavy, weird, um, like almost death core stuff, even back in like 2007 and eight when, you know, deathcore was really at its prime <laughs> and stuff. I would, and, and, and then that evolved into like, you know, uh, I was always a big fan of like a life once lost, which I consider one of the very first like gent bands kind of in a way, you know, yeah. um, especially with like that, that guitar tone and stuff on, on Hunter. But like I, I took influence from that. And then like, uh, you know, my old band toured with periphery in 2009 on thrash and burn. And we got, really tight with them and they just blew me away and i was a fan of bulb which was misha's little stuff that became periphery songs and he had like hundreds of instrumental demos that i would listen to all the time like that made me want to do an instrumental project like that so we uh when i got to talk to spencer for for this uh, a friend of mine is a huge periphery fan and then he was like i was like i know 
a decent amount about them. Like Spencer actually was going to be in uh, Jordan from Still Remains and Bones side band. What? Still Remains broke up. Jordan and Bone had a band called Anthem Alone, and they were looking for a vocalist. Spencer was going to be it, I guess. And then right when they were all stoked and like, oh, my God, we finally got all the people. He's like, yeah, I'm going to go join this other band. Yeah. And I was like, ah, Damn. fuck. But like all the musician friends were big on Bulb. And so when talking to my friend, because I know Periphery fans are stupidly diehard and really freaked me out because I was like, oh, God, people are going to like be like, why don't you ask about this? Yeah. And so in doing that, I was like, okay, I came really prepared. And I was like, oh, it's really crazy like how all these bulb demos keep showing up on Periphery Records 10 years after the fact. Like, It doesn't yeah. seem like they've – that they're not afraid to go back and, and rework something into a thing and it kind of being an Easter egg for, for fans now. I love that so yeah. much, the, especially the Easter egg kind of aspect of it if you're a diehard – like bulb fan and like there's still stuff there's still bulb stuff that hasn't made it to periphery records and i'll like yet. i'll like text misha and be like you need to do like foof on <laughs> you need you need you need to like put this track on a periphery record and he's like i know i know but yeah i actually uh when i was like really first exposed to them i actually exposed a lot of friends and and like tour mates and band friends to bulb even like stray from the path um when we first toured with them in like 2008, I showed it to them and they were like, what the fuck? This is crazy. And they ended up doing a record with Misha. Um, yeah. like not too long after that, but well, yeah. out, of, out of curiosity though, like, you know, if you were as big into periphery and what they were doing back in, in the, the bulb demo days and so forth, have you, you know, I, I prose this to someone on one of the tours that I did an interview with them and, and we weren't allowed to release it yet. Um, you know, being into guitar and stuff like that, did you pick their brains about how to get a certain tone, how to how to achieve, you know, the best clarity between your pedal board and, and all these kind of things? Or was it more of just kind of being a fan of what they did and just, you know, enjoying that aspect of being on tour with them? Yeah, more so that. I, I never really picked their brain about, about tone stuff and like the real technical part of how they do things. It's just like the style was everything I liked about heavy music. Like, pretty and melodic but just super groovy and heavy and i i just you know i figured out you know what kind of tones i liked and you know yeah definitely even in on coma visions there's periphery influence oh, yeah. all over that like wind bulb influence all over it I, I without a doubt there's no denying that and yeah i never but i never like sweated or bugged misha i'm like how do you do this with your guitar you know i never never did that too much i just tried to figure it out on my own like we were chatting before this and i i told you pretty much everything and i'm not saying that i'm some like god of mixing and mastering because i'm not at all i f i just wing it but everything i've learned i've just learned from youtube like i just look look up like simple little things that i'm like how do i do this i'll just like throw it on youtube and like eventually i'll find like oh okay i can i see how to like easily put this in my daw and like organize it and make it you know th that's that's just how i did everything just teaching myself so the thing about coma visions that was interesting to me was like i said the perception that this was music possibly inspired by the accident because it was the only thing from any of you that had been released and i think it was a about a year after the accident, I believe, is when you finally dropped it? Uh, it was actually, ooh, it was like two and a half years okay. after is when, when I released it, but I had started writing it. Well, I like, remember you like posted like and teasers and stuff. Yeah. So, and then, so that's why maybe it didn't feel that long is because it seemed like there was content kind of always being shown. Of that's you true. Doing stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I would always like when I had an idea and, you know, during our recovery after the accident, I had so much downtime and just. And I mentioned this on the other podcast too. Like I just got to a point where like I couldn't just lay and be bedridden anymore and I had to be creative. And I was just like, I'm buying a Kemper and <laughs> I'm, I'm, I have a seven string guitar and I have like a very modest understanding of how to like get this going and I'm just going to do it. And I would get excited about it and, and like bored at home really. And like, that's when I would post those like videos of me playing stuff and then seeing people's reactions to it like everyone's like dude this is fucking awesome and like people were really digging it so i was like man i should just like release something a lot of people a lot of friends even would be like dude you need to like release this a lot of people encouraged me to do it so i did i decided like 
I think it was January of 2017. I had, I had had like a song like that. I was like, this is awesome. I'm really stoked on this. I'm, I want to do more. I like made myself from January of 2017, probably till like August of 2017, do nothing but work on it. And I did it every day. Well, it took a few days off here and there, but <laughs> you, know, you go crazy after a while trying to, trying to get stuff out of your head. But I, I genuinely worked months and months on it. And being inspired by the accident yes it, only in the way that um i knew it was going to be an instrumental project and i was like well there's no vocal content there's nothing people will listen to and relate to that way but what's the most significant thing that's happened to me lately and it, that was the accident and i i developed this like a lot, there's a lot of like atmospheric like soundscapey kind of things in the background of these like heavy rhythmic guitars that like a lot of it sound like spooky and creepy and like it made me think of being back in the hospital and like under the knife kind of stuff. And like, you know, they put you on fucking crazy drugs like that, you know, shit that's like stronger than heroin. They'll inject into your veins. And I hallucinated shit. And like, uh, that was, I just wanted to, I mean, that's kind of a negative thing when you think about it, but I wanted to make it, a positive thing and like that's kind of what i based the whole vibe of it out uh, you know of of that like ep around so it was in listening to the record when it first came out because for me personally when you put it out i figured you know you were like it's it's an instrumental um i kind of went into it looking more for what you're saying by not saying anything the atmosphere of what you're putting into it um you and I over the last few months have gotten gotten to know each other a lot better um, and have since, you know, started texting. And, you know, we were texting when initially we were getting ready to do this a couple of weeks ago. And, you know, I was telling you, you know, I grew up with a cleft lip and a cleft palate. So I have a lot of memories of being in hospitals growing up. Um, the sounds, the, the, the smells and all that kind of stuff. And for me, you know, a song like ICU, um, it kind of reminds me of, of a lot of weird feelings when you I mean there's really no no way to say it like beat around the bush about it but it's like when you spend that much time in a hospital and you have that many surgeries from a childhood and it's like the jarring thing of I was here with my parents or whatever and in this thing and now I'm awake and I'm in pain and I don't know where I am and, and just there's all these like monitors going and there's all these noises and people walking and, and whomever else may be next to you that has their own shit and their families and, and all these kind of things. It's, it's really a cacophony of, of sounds that are kind of uh, i'm kind of getting like goosebumps thinking about it um it's just very emotional um as someone who has been in that not to the severity of what you've gone through obviously but it's it's one of those things like when i hear that you know there's that part where it almost kind of lulls you in and you think like oh the, here's kind of the the brevity of everything and, and then it's almost periphery-esque like boom just beating you over the head and it's fucking chaotic and shit and it's like that reminded me of when I would wake up in the middle of the night and be like in a, a in pain and because the meds might've wore off or whatever, or being jarred awake cause a nurse has to come fucking take your vitals and shit. And yet it's like, that was the only time I've been able to sleep for the last like day and a half. And I just fucking jarred me awake. And like, now I'm like, it's, it, it's getting crazy poked. that, you, that you say that because that's pretty much what I was trying to explain without having vocals was like, and, you know, ICU is, I would say ICU is probably the most aggressive and violent, I guess you could say, song on, on that EP. And so when it drops out and you hear that hospital beeping, that monitor noise, and you hear like the weird, just chromatic, that breathing echoey, machine type thing. Yeah. And you yeah. hear that you can hear it going, and, and you hear the beeping. It's just like, it puts you there. But when then it, when it hits with that, that next part, that's just like super gross and violent. It just like, yeah, that's what I was trying to explain is like you're in and out of all of this shit. And like, it almost seems surreal. And then, and then next thing you know, you're in pain again. And yeah, it's like, it like takes you on a journey yeah. and, and you know, th um, if you've ever, if anyone's ever been through something like you were just describing or like, you know, what, with what happened with us, I, I could see that part really, you know, resonating with someone in a, weird way and yeah. being you know bringing up feelings and stuff but well even like to the point of like smells like Absolutely. i can smell 
certain hospitals I was in. I can, I mean, the, the weird thing is, and like you, you can know, think of it and you can smell it. I know, I, 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 I'm thinking of what my hospital smelled like, and I, I can smell it without smelling. You know, yeah, it's so crazy. It's weird that a sound can make you feel and smell and, and hit hit on all your senses like that when just by listening to something. Yeah, and even the weird thing, like the way you ended the song with the the machines, basically segueing out of the song. It was weird because, like, as that part always comes, I always think about how weird that it is that it's like by the time you've been there for any duration, that those things that are kind of alarming and jarring also then become oddly comforting and become like your white noise things to start being able to block everything out because, like, that becomes like your sort of cicadic rhythms of sorts. So, like, that's that's the thing now that I listen to that, like, I know is a part of my like when I'm going to bed and I'm going to kind of start counting sheep. You're counting your 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 pulse beeps yep. or the machine, you know, your air uh, thingy going or something else that's in the room. Um, and it's it's just I don't know. It's so that song like when I first heard it, like it almost like I, I kind of had to like stop listening to it because <laughs> yeah, it was sure. just like fuck. This is so so emotional and so raw and so so whatever. And I think like the crazy thing is is. You know, you you one hundred percent doing the record all on your own, mixing, mastering, playing everything, and so forth. I, I do wonder if if somebody else, if you would have sent it to somebody else, if that would have still come across. Yeah, that's an interesting thought. Yeah, you never know. I mean, it's not something I never thought about because, like I said, you know, it's some it's a project I've wanted to do, like just me for for years and years, and this happened to be the the downtime to do it. But yeah, that's interesting to think of, like. If I had like written raw stuff and sent it to someone else to perfect and whatever, would would those feelings have translated through? And that's maybe not. It's almost like spooky to think about. Yeah. And you know, something that I'm kind of big on is track listing because I mean, I don't know that I, I would hope that a lot of people still put a lot of faith, not faith, a lot of effort into making sure that a song and a record flows and there's we just spent, we just spent a month doing the sequence yeah, for sure. the Ghost Inside record. Yeah. Finally landed on something. But uh, it's it's interesting to me that in listening to this record, I feel like there is a, a flow to things. Like you know, um, and I gotta look up songs. I'm terrible with songs. Oh, you're good. Um, that was it. So you know, it was kind of interesting. Is you know, it starts off with depth, which I think kind of obviously speaks to for me in your nonverbals kind of speaking to almost setting the tone of this is the depth of the things that I'm, I'm going through. This is what we're going to kind of experience on this record kind of here, just like it was a little sample of what to expect from here. Yep. It's like short and sweet and, yep. and, and, and heavy and it's, and yeah. then, you know, with glimpse and granted like here's the, and this is why I kind of sometimes like doing this. Cause I think it gives more of, I've had these thoughts. Is this really what like, were you intending on? And with like a song like glimpse, like, you know, when I was listening to that, I, I kind of felt like, you know, with this record being called Coma Visions, and, and for those that maybe do not know, like you were in a medically induced coma. Um, I don't remember how long you said it was, but I think you said like 10 days. 10 days, yeah. yeah. Um, so it's one of those things where I was wondering, like, is Glimpse like sort of the things that you said in other interviews that you've done and, and the band guys have where it's basically I had glimpses of things before I, I kind of came in and out of consciousness. So these Absolutely. Are kind of like glimpses of what I was experiencing in music form yeah that's a hundred percent what it is yeah to then going into journey which is now this is the journey that i'm going on through all these things to then icu which is the jarring fucking like now thing like we're kind of going along this thing and then now here's this ICU, is the which ugly is part brutal intense yep. chaotic because that's probably the state you were in so then as you're kind of you know Orion has that's one of the few where I don't really under the title doesn't necessarily mean anything to me because I always think of Orion by Metallica yeah. I just think of stars and things like that and I don't know much about like astrology or any of that kind of stuff so that one is kind of the the one song where I'm like I just like it I don't it doesn't sure, resonate yeah. to me to some story where I, I can, I can touch on it. that if you want um actually if you look at the cover art the constellation of Orion is in there okay and uh yeah I'm really bad I can't even like someone could be like it's these and I'm like yeah sure and dude you know it's so weird um it's it has I am not like super into astrology at all okay. but it, it is like a weird coincidence because <laughs> I am a Scorpio and Orion is like that constellation. He's shooting an arrow at a, at a scorpion. So it like has to do with my constellation. And it's also, I mean, it is a very recognizable constellation. So anyone who look up, looks up can see it and notice it. But I just, I, throughout my entire life, I would be outside, you know, as a kid, like at night skateboarding with friends and then like it would get dark and I'd look up and there it is. It's all, I felt like it's been following me my whole life. Like, 
even just, you know, outside getting a f- fresh air, whatever on any time of the year, doesn't matter. I'll like look up and it's the first thing I see directly above me just always seem to be following me. And I just, that's like a little Easter egg. No one besides me would ever know or understand. That's why you were just like, I don't know what this means, but that's, that's what I was doing with that. So on the way up when the song came on, the only, and it was kind of funny because I was just, you know, <laughs> living in the Midwest, like when you drive, there's just fucking nothing to look at. <laughs> yeah, especially in this area. Yeah. Um, so at one point, you know, I was, as the song was kind of coming on, I was looking at the sky and all that because, you know, we've had kind of bad weather the last couple of weeks. And the only thing I kind of thought of, and it went more because at that point when I was listening to it, I, instead of listening to it in sequential order, I just kind of shuffled because sometimes weird things kind of present themselves when you do that. Sure. Um, so Glimpse had played and then it went into Orion. And the only thing I could think of was, you know, potentially that in the accident itself, you saw glimpses of the sky and maybe saw some constellations or thought of those things or whatever. And that was the only sort of tie I could come up with for Orion to the rest of the record as far as a title. It's close enough, and it's a good thought, actually, because, yeah, like there was a, one of the specific coma visions I had was um, I was, I was uh, for whatever reason, on this basically trip it felt so real i'm thinking about it right now and it felt like it happened i was in asbury park new jersey okay you, and an abandoned a, beach basically there, like old yeah and it was like it looked like dystopian post-apocalyptic but i was at this club called the stone pony which we've played before and it, i was like outside of this club and there were these like people out there and they were like they had like hoods up there was like a, a girl and a guy and other people and they and they like lured me like down this pier off this dock and they started like cutting me with straight razors. And like, I remember this, like it happened. It's so weird. And so the thing about being Asbury park also on the cover art, the skyline in the background of coma visions is Asbury park. And, uh, an interesting thing about that is I, I looked into, um, what people see in comas and what people, what scientists and people have found out and tried to make sense of with comas. And there's still like no definitive answer. Like they, there's not a lot known about it, but um, they it's, it's been said a lot that your brain is trying to make sense of what's going on around you when you're with all the noises, hallucinating and and whatever. So it's like how many surgeries I was. What if those people cutting me were surgeons cutting me open? You know what I mean? It's it's your brain. If it's your brain trying to make sense of what's going on around you and you can't see it and you're not in that like plane, you're in a, you're in a different, you know, you're, you're in a trip somewhere. Like what if those people cutting me up were, was my mind trying to make sense of surgeons cutting me open, you know, and that's fucking crazy. Yeah. I remember waking up from an oral. So for those that may not know about cleft lip and palates, um, basically it's a, it's a oral thing. Um, usually you're, You know, you have a hole in the roof of your mouth, uh, your ears, nose, and throat are all connected. So there's just a lot of issues uh, that you go through when you're growing up with it and so forth. And the cleft lip itself is literally a a flap of skin that's missing in in your top lip. Um, So in going through all that, like I had to go through a lot of, like I said, oral surgeries. Uh, One of the things I needed to do was adjust uh, my gum line. So taking out a tooth or taking out a bone in my hip, putting it into my gum line so it it would help straighten it out Mm -hmm. to then for a 10-year process, like you're getting palate expanders, retainers, whole gamut of things. Um, I remember toward the end, uh, this all like those surgeries and so forth started, I think when I was like 10 or 11. Um, Like I remember the bone graft surgery, never snows on the East coast. Like I'm from Delaware and I remember getting out and basically the, the only way I could leave is if I walked to the bed because with the surgery they did on my hip, basically they needed to make sure that I could walk. Um, yeah. And not have complications yep. further in life yeah. with, yeah. So like I used to have like real, like I remember that was like the worst cause I'd have real bad spasms in like my hip and so forth and didn't want to walk. Um, cause it hurt. Yeah. And so I remember my parents being like, there's a real bad fucking snowstorm coming. If you could just go like, you can fucking lay on the couch. You can do whatever you need to do when we get home. But can you please just get up and walk? And I was like, no, it hurts. And it was weird to have to kind of learn how, and speaking, preaching to the choir, but having to learn how to kind of have to rewalk because it seemingly is so simple until it doesn't feel normal anymore. And then you have to figure out how to 
make it normal. Yeah. You would never know. You would never know. And it's like a thing that we just all take for granted because we're born for the most part, you know, if, if you're, if you're born and, and with a completely able body, you, you know how to walk. It's second nature. You don't think about it. And then when something happens, it is, you, you just like would have never thought it'd be as difficult as it is to, to re literally relearn it, you know? And I remember one of the last surgeries, they were putting a post into my gum line and I woke, I woke up during it. <sighs> Couldn't feel it, but I woke up and I acted like I wasn't awake. But it was really fucked up to be able to feel them in. Like I could, it's you probably almost, couldn't feel the pain, but you felt. I could feel the pressure. instruments. Yeah. yeah, yep. It's crazy. And I remember like tears going down my face because I was like, "What if this wears off when they're still in me?" Yeah, yeah. And it, and then basically to find out when I was done and came to that uh they're like yeah so like this isn't gonna work because like all of the the first surgery you did that bone didn't take the way we thought it was going to so then to basically be told like 10 years worth of all of this shit getting my like face redone and my nose and all of these things that they wanted to do and did didn't work and you have to start over yeah and i was like dude fuck that like at that point i was like almost 17 or 18 and i was like dude now nah, i'm done like if i was if i was meant to have perfect teeth or whatever be quote unquote perfect i'm fucking over it like nah i'm good fucking take all my teeth like i'll brush them i'll do whatever but like i'm not going through all this shit again and then on top of that thinking about the mental shit that i went through like you know you and i touched on this and this is something i kind of wanted to hit on with with what you went through because i grew up and being compared to quote unquote normal people like oh you're this size and this weight at this age here's normal mm -hmm. you're far below that you're not normal being told these are the things you're not going to do because of you know be, being born with like a heart murmur and all these kind of things and just thinking about most of my childhood to adolescence, being told, these are the things you're not going to do. You're not normal. At that age. At that age. Yeah. And just always, and where you're already self-conscious of shit, it's like, holy fuck. Like, no wonder I probably never, I have insecurity issues because, per, like, self-doubt and all that. Because it's like, well, I'm having medically trained professionals telling me that I'm not normal. And I just think about it now as an adult. And I'm like, that's so fucked up. Yeah. And, you know, like we were kind of talking about, and I know now we're kind of rambling on, but you know, it's one of those things, like I was wondering in going through your rehab, because you did the rehab in Grand Rapids where I live, mm -hmm. uh, you, you know, our mutual friend, Tony Narcus, uh, videotaped and photo pho photographed, uh, that experience. So, you know, I kind of felt more of a, a greater sense of feeling like I was kind of going along with it, with you, with you being so close, uh, sure, yeah. with someone I know and, and being literally like five minutes from my house and wondering was there any kind of maybe mental hangups that you went through in going through all of this? Yeah. I mean, absolutely. You know, I, when everything happened and I found out, um, that I had lost my leg cause I was laying in bed for a few days, not knowing I had lost a leg cause like all these meds were wearing off and I just wasn't a hundred percent coherent yet. I have a random question and forgive it if it's kind of in, in, insensitive. Did you experience any like phantom limb uh, oh, situations? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I still still do. Yeah. Every few weeks, maybe it just, you know, it'll, it'll almost feel like uh it'll, it'll, it'll feel like a tingle where my toes should be like, you feel it. It feels like it's down there, like on the bottom of your foot or something. And it's not, but that's just, it's cause you've i've lived you know 30 years with a leg and when it's gone it's like your brain does not know how to process that it's not there anymore and it just really wild so that does still happen it happened a lot more frequently like initially but <clears throat> yeah the mental stuff um i i was pretty positive about everything um immediately um one of the big reasons was i just didn't want my friends and family who I knew this would affect like very negatively. I wanted them to see that I'm going to be fine and not, don't worry about me. I, I'm going to figure this shit out. But yeah, man, I'm a human being. I had so many dark spots during the recovery and, and insecurity. Absolutely. You know, 
people people look at you to this day. I'll go to the gas station and that and, word where to go that made me laugh so hard when I was on my flight listening to that. Oh my <laughs> god, that that's a true story. I know. Well, so I, this yeah. guy was to be fair, this guy was a little. He seemed a little off. Like he just was like an eccentric guy. But <laughs> yeah, like you know, it, it, I definitely for a while felt insecure, and you know, I felt like. Well, what's it going to be like? How am I going to do things? Like I am so used to like, you know, portraying this image of myself that I'm used to. And now I'm like disfigured and like, how the hell am I going to adjust to this? I, I had those thoughts, but I, I immediately just would literally like turn on curb your enthusiasm and distract myself from those thoughts. Anything I could do, to distract myself from any negative thoughts like that, I did, even if it was as simple as watching Curb Your Enthusiasm or playing Call of Duty. Anything to distract, any 1% of like positivity I could find, I latched onto and just made myself forget those those bad thoughts and those and those questions. And then I was, and I just made myself, you know, I'll, I'll figure that out. Don't worry about that. Got to learn how to walk again before being worried if you don't look as cool as you did or if, or like... You know, if you can even play drums again, like initially it was like, I need to learn how to walk again with a prosthetic leg. You know, like I, I had my days, but you know, as the years went on, all of those thoughts and, and like feelings of insecurity and, and the mental stuff just went away. And and when I got my leg, I was like, it looks fucking cool. It looks like <laughs> Batman's leg. Like if he had a prosthetic leg and I, you know, I tried, I tried to just stick to those thoughts and look at positive things. And that's what helped me with the mental stuff. It's really going to be a shame when you become a T-1000 and I got to put you down. <laughs> yeah, for real. <laughs> I got one in there. When we go in the studio later, I got, you'll see my, you'll see my T, my T-800 head in there. But, uh, sorry. A little, Tons of nerdy shit. I want to add a little bit of brevity to that. <laughs> um, you know, something else and I'm going to ask this and, and I am in no way, shape or form feel this way but i know that it seemingly always goes hand in hand in, in recovery of of any sort of rehabilitation how much religion was kind of pushed on you through through this whole thing um i wouldn't say religion i'm not a religious person no um, neither am i but i'll tell you what man everything that happened and even to this day like how it seems like the stars align sometimes it's just some, sometimes I question like, man, is this, you know, the, is everything meant to be theory goes through my mind quite a lot. Like from where we were to where we are now and everything that's happened in between and how it's happened, there's been so many things and I can't really like specifically think of those right now on the spot but like there's just been so many things that have happened that i'm just like this is crazy even like here's a simple one my doctor when i flew got flown from el paso to grand rapids was a fucking drummer yeah what what are the chance how is my my doctor a drummer a guy who's gonna understand a drummer losing his right dominant leg how did that how did i get that of all the hospitals and all the doctors you know what i mean mm -hmm. Things like that have happened so much to where it's made me go, man, maybe, maybe this shit was meant to be, and I was destined to do something, you know, something greater than I ever thought I could, which is like overcoming something and maybe being an example. And, and I wouldn't say that I, I, I never had any like exactly like religious thoughts about it, but definitely more than ever before in my life from the ac from birth until the accident i have never had any thoughts of like this is eerily like lining up too weird to be a coincidence i have had some questions about that but yeah plenty of those kind of things seemingly throughout all of this you know between whether it be the writing of the record, the things that you went through, it seems like you, similarly to me, are someone who takes a lot in, uh, processes it, tries to make the best informed decisions you can. Has, in going through this, 
have you talked to like a therapist about anything? Like, is that part of, cause I know like in some of my stuff, like I had to go through uh, yearly like evaluations with a psychiatrist and so forth just to for sure see yeah. how I'm, how I'm doing because I'm going through a thing that not everyone goes through. Um, yeah. Obviously same with you from the, you know, something may have been taken away from me, which actually I'll kind of go. So no stone, no stone unturned. This is where this, this question kind of came from to me almost felt like, the was it the the is it eight nine ten nine or ten uh steps of grief or five steps of grief uh loss denial anger acceptance is it four or five i don't even know i just thought that sounded cool okay <laughs> and it was it's just like a it's a cool way to say like no looking back no turning back like like just fucking dominate everything overcome it Okay. That that was the sentiment. Yeah. See, to me, like I, I took it a completely different way, which sure. I guess that's the fun thing about music is you can probably from my own experiences, I guess, infer what you will from it. But I kind of had figured that was kind of where it is. It is kind of the the various stages of grief, basically, that you were going through, and obviously, you guys had such an amazing support uh, group uh, between fans, other bands, yourselves. But it's always one of those things, like, you know, without getting into specifics on record, um, I'll tell you later, but uh, my wife went through a really bad car wreck, and it's still something that affects her every day. Sure. Um, and it is one of those things where, you know, a lot of times I can't I can't help her. Um, I didn't go through it. And so it's like I can empathize, but I feel like for a lot of times I try to tell her, like, I think you need to go talk to someone Mm -hmm. and it's kind of interesting and listening to a lot of podcasts and listening to a lot of interviews. Now I don't want to say it's become a trend, but it seems like especially in the hard rock, you know, metal hardcore world, a lot of people want to focus on positivity, want to focus on talking about hard things that are to talk about mental health issues and so forth. And it just kind of seems like one of those things where it would seemingly be kind of hard to get through what you did without maybe talking about it to someone. Right. Yeah. And you know what? Like support groups and so forth. Sure. Yeah. And, um, you know, the thing about like, you know, people wanting to hear positivity and, and things like that and stories like this, that is therapy. Like that, that can be therapy. Um, so I think that maybe that's why that's like an appealing thing to sit down and listen to a podcast. Like we're talking right now, you might take away from this, anyone who's listening could take away something from this, like where they might think of things differently now or look at things in a different way. Not not saying that I'm a therapist by any means (laughs) at all, but, but you know, just talking and listening are essential, I think. And I did not ever have, I never had a professional therapist, a psychiatrist or anything. I was never diagnosed with PTSD. Um, I just dealt with things and processed things my own way. That was 50% of it. And then 50% of it was that support group of all of our friends and bandmates and family and the fans, just like the overwhelming support constantly every day. You know, social media can be fucked up and really shitty. But for me, when I was going through that stuff, getting messages from, from fans and people like just of just positivity and support. And like, you can do this, like you're going to be fine. Like that, uh, that might've been my therapy. And I, and I think that that is a huge part of what helped me. And, and I think a part of it as well is just, that's, that's the way I am with, with processing things. And I try to really think of things from a realistic, but, even if I have to force it positive standpoint, you know? Um, but yeah, no, I, I never had any, any professional help. It's always interesting. Cause like, you know, when you hear these things, I do think that it, that is a good thing though. I think, you know, just talking to you about it, that this, this is, it's nice. It helps. It's like good to talk about these things, even though it happened so long ago. And, and I, and I'm, you know, for the most part over it now. I mean, not even for the most part I am, I've moved on with life and I am, in my opinion, I'm, I'm thriving and I'm like very proud and happy of where I'm at and where I'm going and looking forward to the future. And, uh, you know, 
th- it might not be like that for everybody. And I, and seeking professional help is another outlet to just talk to somebody. Cause you can't keep shit bottled up. Like no. you just absolutely can't cause you, it will break you. Absolutely. Like, so I am, I am a firm believer, even though I never went through it, I, it's, it can only do good. You know, the, what was kind of interesting about this one decade coma visions thing was thinking about how it seemingly kind of came out of nowhere, you know, and, and speaks to me at least volumes about it's, it's everything you're not saying that, and it's so deafening what you're saying in this music to me. Um, that it does kind of make me wonder, even if you know these were ideas that you had prior to everything happening, that where was there ever a feeling of this is going to kind of be its own thing, and then whatever I decide to do from here is going to be something different because it's maybe not rooted in that theme. Yes, that's that's absolutely. That that's kind of what I like told myself from the start was I'm gonna do this EP and I'm gonna write this music and do everything and it's gonna have this theme and then I'm gonna see how you know how people react and if it's cool and people are liking it and then I'm just gonna do stuff when I have time and when I feel like it and I never wanted it to get in the way of cause Ghost Inside is my number one priority and my passion my number one everything I, I put into the ghost inside, like not saying I didn't work hard for one decade, but, but the ghost inside is like that. I go into like a different mode when it's time to do work for, for the band. But uh, yeah, I, I kind of just wanted to get that EP out, have that be the theme and see where it goes from there. And I'm just doing whatever I want, whenever I want there's, I've released uh four singles since coma visions just singles and they don't really have that coma visions like vibe like no. but but it's just fun for me and it's like now it's just creating music for people to to listen to and if if you like it that's cool and if not that's cool too like i just didn't know if it would become a thing where it would not be called one decade at that point like if you would want to change it and call it something else and just let what you're creating now be whatever this new sure. thing would be and let coma visions in one decade be that. No, I never, I never really thought about it, about doing that. Okay. I, I had always planned on just having that be the name. Um, and I, yeah, I, I'm so bad at coming up with names, man. <laughs> so, so I'm not trying to put myself through coming up with names again. So it's, it's one decade and I like the name. It's cool. And yeah. Um, so the fun thing, you know, obviously you just touched on the fact that you've dropped four other singles. Um, what, you know, obviously this is a fun side thing that you're doing. Mm-hmm. With so many bands and band people having their side things, will there, do you have a desire to even play this out? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, the one decade stuff? Yeah. Absolutely. I'm, I'm going to, you know, it, it's like you can't force inspiration, but there's there's been times. The last single I did... Uh, it's called Dead Star. Uh, I just, ha- I just was sitting on the couch and just riffs entered my head and this like melody and I just was like, I'm gonna go. Went in the studio and just did it. It's like when inspiration strikes, I'll do something if I'm feel if I'm not. And sometimes it happens and it's like, nah, this didn't really pan out the way I wanted. I have tons of stuff that like I never released that I just wasn't stoked on. But if it's something that I like, I'm like, oh, okay, this is gonna be the next single. I'll do it. It's just when, when inspiration strikes really. And you know, now that, um, the ghost inside new record is done. Um, I do have, I do have some time if I want to do more than just a single here and there. Like I do plan on this year doing some other EP or, or whatever Uh, to what capacity. I'm not really sure yet, but I would like to sit down and take a few months to like put out some more one decade stuff sometime this year. Can't tell you when because it's just got to kind of happen organically. So, but yeah, I definitely plan on keeping it going. Um, playing out, playing it live, playing it live would be awesome. And I've actually talked to some friends about like doing it with me one day. It's all talk for now. Um, maybe I won't say no, but I can't tell you when that would be. 
which instrument would you play? Oh, guitar. Hundred <laughs> percent, man. I want to play guitar live. That'd be that would be fun. Um, and and it's like different. And yeah, I would definitely be doing guitar. And um, I mean, I got a lot of a lot of drum buddies that would absolutely crush those songs. Probably make them better than I did. So, <laughs> would you ever think of adding vocals to it or having vocalists come on and do something to it? Originally, I wanted to release Coma Visions instrumental, and then I was like, "Oh, you know, it'd be sick is if I like, did a re-release of it with like reimagined, different, yeah, like maybe maybe have it remixed, remastered professionally or something, and have like all my buddies do vocals on it. That'd be cool, and I still think that's a cool idea. But after after it was out for a while and out there in the world, and like I was listening to it, and like other people were listening to it, I I don't I don't think I want to. I think I want it to stay instrumental. I think that's that's what I've decided on. So, and then again, you know what? Like I said, sometimes like inspiration just hits and ideas just hit. And if, and if you run with it and it's cool, do it. So maybe there will be, you know, a one decade EP or full length or single someday with vocals on it. Maybe I'm. It's it's literally whatever the fuck I want to do. Yeah, which, ever, is, which is awesome. In demo form, have you ever put your own vocals over it? No, no. no I. <laughs> I uh, that's one that's one thing i i i lack in is is vo- singing screaming that's not that's not my world unfortunately <laughs> um kind of slowly i guess in, in as we kind of wind this down a little bit um So, you know, you talked about putting out this this record and, and self-doing it. And something I always find kind of fun in talking to some of these people, like uh, someone who's very much uh, akin to you in, in some ways, uh, Brandon from Atreyu has Atreyu, obviously, where he, uh, and this is actually the illusion I was going to make when we started is, I don't think a lot of people knew that how heavy Brandon is in the songwriting aspect mm-hmm. until one of their DVDs where you see him coming in, like showing Dan and Travis, like, here's the guitar riff. Here's the you know melody that you'll play over to this. Oh, here's my drum. Hey, I'm also writing the lyrics and so forth. And it's like, holy shit, like mm-hmm. dude writes, you know, comes in with full song ideas and I, fuck, I didn't know that. Mm-hmm. Um so, you know, adversely, you know, with this, it was like, oh, I didn't know you play guitar or, you know, wrote all these kind of things and, and whatnot. But when putting it out, you know, Brandon has a tray, which is the big label machine thing. Of course. He has uh, Hell or High Water, which was just a fun side project that's more rock oriented. And then even as of the last few years has American Gentleman, which is more of his kind of sync opportunity uh, with it being more like kind of rooted in like alternative, like hip hop kind of stuff. And, you know, I was asking him about, you know, you're on something that's kind of very regimented. We need a product by this time. Like, you're going to do your album cycle (laughs) and so forth, and then we need you to go back to the studio, put out another record, and then you start the whole process over. Right. Um, Hello High Water didn't necessarily start off that way. Slowly has kind of become that as well, but a different medium for him. And then American Gentleman is, we're dropping shit whenever we want. Mm -hmm. So you have this really interesting broad spectrum of regimented, loose as fuck so with one decade was there ever any interest from a label uh to either put it out and kind of get a little bit wider push or do you find that having it be 100 percent self-reliant on you and all f assets is fun because you can just do whatever you want whenever you want the second one that's okay. that's that's exactly how i intended it to be and i, I you know um I purposely like I released it and I posted about it and I made like a one decade, you know, Instagram account. It's it's pretty it's not very active. Like I, I'm admittedly not very good at at self promoting with it. That's kinda how I wanted to do it. I wanted to put it out there and it's like this little self contained little Easter egg you might find one day and be like, What? I didn't know this this is cool. Like I, I never shopped it to labels. I never wanted it to get bigger than it is. Like that's exactly how I wanted it to be. And and yeah, I just I I love collaborating with people. I absolutely love it. It's my favorite thing to do. Like being in the studio is my favorite thing about being in a band, making records, being creative, all of that stuff. Writing, I love doing it. I want to do it with any bands out there listening. If you were ever wanting a little bit of flavor from from me, I would be very willing to do it. Like that's pretty much all I want to do. But yeah, like there, there, this is like something I need to do where I just can have 100% control over it. And that's how I wanted it to be. So 
working with Will Putney on this last record, what is, did you gleam anything from him from the production side of things that you have started to incorporate in what you do on your own or any of the producers you've worked with for that matter, I guess? Um, well, you know, I haven't really since, since we finished, we, so we finished up the record in, uh, November and then vigil finished some vocal stuff on his own in, uh, January. So it's been a lot of focusing on like wrapping everything up and like, now now it's, now it's down to like mix stuff and detail stuff and like literally down to like, you know, 13 seconds into track four, can you turn this up? this down stuff like that. So it's been a lot, it's been a long process of, of things like that. Um, so I haven't really dug into, I haven't this year and, you know, even before Australia, which was in, I went out there in December and we played, um, on the 11th or 12th of January. I haven't done anything in the studio. I haven't written anything, but yeah, they're, I mean, working with Will and watching him work, which is like watching a fucking mad scientist work, uh, there's definitely, there's definitely things I've picked up. I try not to bug him too much about like, Hey, how do you do this here? How do you do this there? I just like trusted him and let him do his thing. And, uh, but watching him do what he does make, it gives me, it gives me, uh, some ideas and like drive to do things a little differently and more organized, especially cause I just, man, I just, I'm my, my sessions and stuff in my studio are just so, out of control like unorganized (laughs) and it's uh yeah but but watching will work is uh it's like watching uh i don't know it's uh it's just crazy he's he's a psychopath in the best way we loved working with will on this record talk to a handful of people that have worked with him and just as a fucking genius i'll have to play that if you if you haven't i assume you heard the new body count uh you know what no we but uh no, we Ice T was was coming in. Uh, he, there was a couple days he came in like early in the morning before we started our session to like work on that record. But like, no, Will didn't Will didn't show us anything. Um, I bet it's fucking hard as shit, dude. I I I don't doubt it. I'd I'll love play, I'll play it for you. I'd done. love to hear it. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Uh, yeah. Will Will is amazing. Like, um, just immediately like clicked. We have the, like, we all have like, he has our sense of humor. It's like one of those producers that like, he feels like he's the sixth member of the band kind of thing. You know, um, he gets it, uh, writing riffs with him was literally just like so easy and just happened so organically. And it was just, everything about it was incredible. Well, I feel like, you know, serendipitously, you know, I was talking with, uh, Adam from Lorna shore, and I was basically saying, I wonder how much of the that vibe that you get right away with Will is the same intangible that I think Josh has, Schroeder, that he just always feels like the extra part of whoever, whatever band he's in because he's not afraid to get in and, and get dirty and work with you. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And I think that's kind of what's always separated, you know, Adam D from everybody or Will or Josh is that they're going to get sit there and go, I don't, they're more collaborative because they're really good musicians yeah. good songwriters and i think that's always what separates those producers from that aspect from everybody else is they want the best because they're also involved in it not like, just like literally i'm a producer you're paying me to do this and push the buttons and now you go these are your songs yeah and here's an example of of will doing that with us so i haven't really talked about this much either but it's pretty pretty amazing when when i look back on it when we first approached will to do the record we got on like a conference call with him we were telling him, you know, we have some songs, blah, blah, blah. We want to do this. We want to continue writing and have you produce and this and that. And I was like, yeah, uh, I think to make the process go faster, I just want to program the drums. And he's like, no. <laughs> he's like, you should, you got, you play the drums. Like, he's like, it's fine. We'll, we'll make it work. And I was just like, I mean, I was like, I know I could, but like, I knew it would be very, very difficult um, to, be playing drums every day for like two weeks or a week or whatever. But he is the one that convinced me and pushed me to actually play the drums on this record. I before, you know, a year and a half ago going into like, okay, we're writing a record. I was like, I'll just program the drums, like whatever that's, that was literally my mindset. And then he's like, he convinced me and pushed me to do it, which is an example of him digging in deep and 
getting involved with it and wanting to do it right. And I'm so glad that he made me do it. And I struggled a lot. It was very hard. And it was a thing of like, I had, you know, we had like a few songs ready to go. And then we like continued writing in, in May of last year. <clears throat> and I was used to all these songs, but we like, while we were writing, we were programming drums to like write guitars and put vocals over. So I knew the patterns. And I knew the, how the yeah. songs went, but going down and tr- playing them for the first time during the tracking session, that's hard. If you're able-bodied, that's like, that can be difficult. And for me, it was just like, there were some times where like, I got very frustrated and I, w- I would like get really mad and, and I'd be like, sorry. And Will was like, it's fine. Like super calm about it. And he like, he like put up, he like put up with me, you know, and, and worked with me through it. And it's just, I'm just so glad I did that instead of the way I originally, my thought process was, you know, programming. I'm glad I didn't do that. I'm glad it's actually me playing. Last question before we plug socials and wrap this up. Something in thinking about the mechanics of your, your prosthetic you use for playing drums. Have you been able to, come up with different types of rhythms because of how you're able to play? I don't know if that question makes sense. But it does make sense. About. Um, it does make sense, and I haven't yet, no. I, I basically use the device um, to mimic how I used to play, as if a leg were there. And I and I still, for the, I actually, the my right, my right limb, the one that's missing, that's still my dominant side. So, I'm leading with the left limb or the right limb. Sorry. And uh, yeah, that's just, it's just there to mimic how I've always played. Mm-hmm. And it was, and it was still like having to relearn how to play drums, like the muscle memories there, but it was, it was like executing. It was an absolute mind fuck because there's a latency. Yeah. You know, you don't have an ankle control. You don't have the same attack. So like I had to like over time and practicing and playing had to like, figure out the timing of these latencies to when I strike the device. You're almost having to probably preemptively go before you would normally go like yes. on a beat or whatever. Yes, a, like like a little bit, like slightly. Yeah. So absolute an absolute <laughs> mind fuck to learn how to do. And I and I still, dude, I'm not I, I haven't fully got it down. Like I I am not perfect. I, I I have a lot of work to do on that. And I would like, you know, I'd like to continue to improve the device and, and figure out some other things that could possibly help with that. Um, so yeah, I mean, just want to continue to expand on the hammer is what we call it yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and see if I can just keep making it better and better and helping me play better. So when are we going to get this, uh, Nike collab custom made shoe? Oh my God, that would be so sick. I would love anything to do with Nike. Like even if they just send me a, free pair of shoes or something like <laughs> anything at all i am obsessed i am a nike head uh most of the guys in my band are big adidas fans and i i like adidas too but um yeah the you know the the ultra boost and the nmds and all those they're so comfortable but with me and the prosthetic it's like i i bear most of my weight throughout an entire day on my left side and like the shoes are almost like too soft too squishy sock material sometimes my toes will get like on my on my my real foot on my left on my left side i'll get like scrunched up and like uncomfortable nikes for the most part even like the air max 270s which are like almost a almost a nike ultra boost version like it's like a like a you slip it on and then they have their air max under it but they're more snug they're more they feel more secure and i don't get that kind of like too soft uh of a feeling so like I, I think I'm probably I think I'm the only guy in my band that that wears Nike. Everyone else wears Adidas. Let them have it. I want Nike. <laughs> <laughs> um, where can everyone find you online? And obviously, New Ghost Inside Record, and probably some shows you announced a show really recently. Um, yep. Yep. So uh, I'm on Instagram at Ill Grip I L L G R I P. I'm on Twitter MTN Mountain Drew two two two. I don't really use Twitter no, much though. You used um, to for a hot minute. You were pretty active. Yeah, I, I don't know. I really I really don't use it much anymore. I need to get back on it, though, because Twitter's... Dude, a, you can make some cool shit happen. Maybe that's how you make your Nike connection happen. Dude, for real. I think Twitter's Twitter's also, like, the main one. How am I... 
I don't know. I love Instagram. It's got all, it's got everything streamlined in there for me. Uh, yep. So we got, uh, we got Germany full four fet, full, <laughs> full force fest. Uh, that's coming up. That's June. I want to say 27th, um, in Germany. Uh, and then we're playing on July 4th in London. Okay. Ironically, it will be playing uh, Brixton Academy. And, uh, and that's just like a legendary venue. And that's that's going to be incredible. And then we are playing Worcester this summer, uh, July 11th. And that's going to be at the Palladium Outdoors. Tickets still available. There's plenty of time to get tickets for that. Um, other than that, you know, we, we're, we're done with the record. Can't tell you a release date. We may or may not have an idea. But uh, it's done, and hopefully everyone will be hearing something about it sooner than later. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for taking the time. I know I uh, bugged you about it for long enough. Yeah, well, I'm glad we made it happen finally. Thanks for coming here and making me not not making me drive the Grand Rapids, so I appreciate it. Yeah, no, not a problem. We'll have to maybe do another one of these uh, when the record drops. Yeah, we'll have to follow up. Cool. So that was my conversation with Andrew from The Ghost Inside, One Decade. Um, Got pretty raw and real in that, as we said in the intro. Um. I'm over here crying, dude. I I I think you can kind of hear me getting choked up a little bit as I was kind of talking about some of the stuff when we were talking about ICU, uh, the song. Um, you know, something actually, it, it's so, it, it's not amusing. Um, pretty much nothing that Andrew and the Ghost Inside dudes went through is amusing. But um, we were talking about our, our mutual love of, of dogs and so forth. And, um, you know, Andrew sent me a photo, and I think it's been shared uh, on his Instagram account and so forth. But uh, the day that they brought, like, four or five dogs in when he was in his hospital bed and i was like oh that must have been the best like having you know four or five golden retrievers and shit just in your bed like getting to play with them and pet them like that's heaven and you know he was like oh it was so cool like and it definitely lifted my spirits and i was like yeah and then like when we were leading up to this conversation i was looking forward to to playing with his dog hank uh and unfortunately hank would make noise um if you listen to him on the downbeat podcast you can hear hank barking in the background and obviously for those who have listened to this i had to put my dog down on new year's day so i uh take any opportunity to go play with dogs that i can because i don't have that anymore so i was a little bit bummed when i got there he's like i had to go take hank to my parents house because you know he'd make noise and all that and i was like oh okay it's okay i wouldn't have cared i'd have left it all in oh i would have i mean you can in the first couple probably almost every episode for a while in the beginning of the podcast you can hear Allie barking at something in the background so indirectly it's like i've been dealing with it for years yeah we have a studio dog on discography discussion named sky you can hear the uh collar Yep, all the time. And Sky's just as much of a co-host on the podcast as any of us. As Jeff? I, Sky shows up more. <laughs> I hope, if you're listening, Jeff, I hope you uh, hope you picked up on that. It was a slight, my friend, a slight. But uh, no, this was uh, this was a lot of fun. Um, you know, and I also like the fact that you know uh, I was kind of worried that you know Ghost Inside fans may uh, be kind of bummed we didn't really talk about Ghost Inside. But right there at the end, you know, there was some cool stuff. Uh, I actually really enjoyed that story uh, about him saying that you know Will Putney. I mean, golden child that we talk about all the time lately, it seems, uh, really championing Andrew to play the drums live, like actually playing them, not just programming them and letting that be what's on the record. And I thought that was really cool. And I think that kind of speaks to the fact that, you know, this new Ghost Inside record, like he really wanted it to be all of the guys, all the instruments being played by everyone and in this day and age you know where there's a lot of programming going on between guitar tracks and everything and drums and so forth it was really cool to hear that you know andrew played the drums on the on this new record and i'm not going to speak too much about the record um i will say will has doing some really cool producing tricks uh when andrew was playing me a couple of songs i uh was like oh it's cool that this thing's happening here like i've never heard that in a a song of this this style usually the exact opposite of this thing is happening and he was like oh yeah that was really cool yeah that was something you know will kind of was playing around with or came up with this idea and i was just like god damn it man will putney is the fucking fucking mac daddy of uh producing metal records right now like everything sounds great everything sounds mixed well and all that shit and you're just like god damn you will putney why do you make like the greatest records i've ever heard yeah yeah i mean will will's a genius i mean i don't really know how else to say it um dude dude can pull sounds like i mean if you listen to what he did on that newest norma jean record yep i mean it's uh <laughs> like he de- like when Corey was talking about it with us he was like yeah i mean it's just something about having will there he pulled the sound 
out of us that you know it, it, it just sounds very fresh and very new and um it just seems like I, will just has a penchant for that and for a band like the ghost inside you know i, I can only imagine the sky's got to be the limit on that it's a uh... Like I said, I'm going to try to be very vague and not talk about anything, but I definitely one of the first songs that he played, I, I was like, holy shit, holy shit. Um, I, y'all are in for something when this thing drops. I'm just going to tell you that it's, it's, uh, it's really amazing. Um, so that's all to speak to that. I probably shouldn't even have said what I said, but, um, sorry. It's not like you're, it's not like you're playing it on the podcast. It's fine. Yeah, yeah, no, it's actually very faintly in the background. You can hear it. Um, but no, um, Hey, was that a jab? <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was really cool uh, getting to spend a little bit of time with Andrew, getting to see his little studio set up, uh, getting to see all of his like horror mask collections and so forth. And uh, Andrew and I have kind of really hit it off. I uh, have a really strange sense of humor that we both uh, share. And uh, obviously living only an hour away um, and having a lot of mutual friends, uh, I feel like it was just kind of fell right into place. So I'm really glad, like I said in the intro, and I've said uh, quite a bit, really glad we got to do this, really glad we got to do this in person. Um, so I want to thank Andrew for allowing me to come into his home and, and opening up and talking so honestly with us. Um, something that's a theme, actually, I think all this year so far, we've had tremendously great guests who have been very forthcoming with a lot of stuff, not holding anything back, just kind of speaking from the heart. And you know, that's something Dan and I constantly always say, like, it's great when you have people who are willing to give decently long answers and don't hold anything back and i don't know it just seems like in the like at the end of last year going into everything going on this year and what we have coming up that just seems to be a reoccurring trend i mean as of when we're recording this uh the lord of shore episode the part one with adam is gone everywhere like alt press picked it up prp metal insider and everything has been pretty overwhelmingly positive um and i was really worried that when when and if it got picked up that people were going to be like fuck this band fuck them you know fuck the podcast people for having him on and giving them a platform and everyone's been we didn't do anything though (laughs) no but i mean that's the thing though is like we live in and that was kind of what i was trying to bring the point home is we're in this cancel culture where i don't think people realize that there's collateral damage to to other things beyond the one person you're pissed off about and you know i'm I'm just kind of glad to see that at least like my way of thinking and kind of being like i think there needs to be more of this presence in the the narrative of what's going on that yeah you can not condone what one person did but don't damn the rest of the people in the band because i mean i don't know how many times i've done an interview with a band at a venue and someone goes oh shit i didn't even know you were i didn't even realize you were gone and let alone doing an interview and it's like you're all in the same venue (laughs) <laughs> like <laughs> you know it's just and that's just something minute is doing an interview for 30 40 minutes like not to mention like what someone's personal life is when you're not around them no doubt yeah so it, it's been kind of a trip to see everyone be pretty positive to the response uh selena who set up the interview with lorna shore i mean we've had examples where something like this happens and the publicist is not too stoked uh on us uh so it's a thing where i am pleasantly surprised that Adam, Selena, fans who listen to it, and everyone else have been, the response has been overwhelmingly positive, and that's awesome, because I I hope that that allows more interviews we do to showcase that you can you can say what's on your mind, and it's a platform where you can kind of talk at length and speak your mind, and people will get a better insight into who you are, and that's the whole point of this. So I'm, I'm pleasantly surprised that how that shit has gone with Lorna Shore. And it makes me, and with this interview and how I kind of opened up in it, I'm hoping this is a trend going forward that we can kind of have more great conversations like this. Totally, man. I mean, that's what we're here for. And uh, I never get tired of listening to it, whether I did the interview or I didn't, you know, I always say my biggest benefit is I get to hear these interviews before anybody does. And uh, I can, uh, I can always tell when something's going to be special. Which really bums me out about that one interview that we did that we did never get to post, but I, I'll shut up about that. Yeah, we'll get it out one day. <clears throat> and uh, in wrapping up, if you would like to follow the Ghost Inside, simple enough, Ghost Inside, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Uh, keep up with them. They got a couple of show or a show announced at this point. I think they got a show over on July 4th overseas in Germany, I think is what he said. Um, so go check them out. Support them. Um Never know what dates they're going to be doing. Uh, touring seems to be pretty limited as of now. Just one-off fly dates or one-off shows. Many festivals as they appear to be. Um, but definitely always something very special at all these shows from any of the footage and videos and so forth that I've seen. So go out and support the Ghost Inside. Um, band that definitely deserves your attention and support. 
If you would like to keep up with Andrew, you can find him on Instagram at illgrip and Twitter at Mountain Drew, M-T-N-D-R-E-W-222. As he said, he's not really active on that, but I think you might see that change because uh, we've been talking about him trying to get a Nike sponsorship, and maybe Twitter is the way to do that. And if you would like to follow One Decade, find them on uh, Instagram at One Decade Band. Uh, go check out that record, Coma Visions. It's super solid. There's been four other singles released since that uh, release of 2017. Uh, hopefully we'll have some new material in the works. And... Uh, Maybe we'll have Andrew back on once this Ghost Inside record is all wrapped up and uh, talk more about that because, like I said, it's a pretty special record. And uh, for Metal Nexus, simple enough, metalnexus.net, Facebook at Metal Nexus, Instagram at metal.nexus, and Twitter at metal underscore nexus. And Dan will tell you where he can be found. Well, I can be found listening to the new Hope's Fall single, Hall of the Sky, on YouTube. Uh, it's fucking killer, and uh, you should check it out, definitely. We need to get Adam Morgan back on to uh, talk all about it with us. And uh, so that's a shout-out to you, Adam, if you're listening. We need you back on, man. Uh, you're, you're, you're the uh, dreamer of the dreams, so we need to talk about that. But if you're looking for little old me, you can find me on Twitter at Discuss Metal Dan, on Facebook under Daniel Terry. You can find out my other podcast at Discuss discussmetal.com you can always send me an email at discussmetaldan at gmail.com so, I mean there's all kinds of ways you can get a hold of me if that's uh if that's your bag or you feel like yelling at me or telling I'm telling me I'm a bad person I'm, I'm up for all that so hit me up and if you would like to keep up with all things this podcast you can find us simply enough at Bruce Speak Pod Facebook Instagram Twitter Patreon at Bruce Speak Pod uh, if you would like to support us non-monetarily head on over to whatever podcast app you're on leave us a rating review us let us know helps us out tremendously if you would like to support us monetarily in a different way we have a Teespring that's a thing you can get our podcast logo on just about anything we got pins available fifteen dollars gets you one shipped in the united states if you live outside the u.s hit us up let us know we will get you one uh we are trying to get dan to furnace fest one way shape or form yeah i think that's all the plugs in our way so let's get on to our sponsors well yeah but i was gonna say what do i gotta do john if i if i want my hair to be on point I, what do i do about that well yeah we're getting there uh our sponsors on point palmade get yourself some beard oil and palmade from on point palmade head over to on point palmade.com use our code bsp15 let them know that we sent you support them for supporting us if you'd like to follow them on facebook and instagram and twitter it's simply enough on point palmade bean bastard coffee if you would like to uh stay awake and drink some delicious coffee while supporting a local business head on over to the bean bastard Get you some delicious coffee. Facebook and Instagram at the Bean Bastard. Looks like they are just hitting all over Buffalo, New York area with that uh, bastard mobile, and just uh, it just goes to show you, man. If you want something bad enough, you can make it work. So, congrats to those guys for everything that they've been doing and making the delicious coffee they did. Uh, Andrew basically has all of the coffee that I. <laughs> <laughs> that I had. I was going to give him like a half a bag of each, and then he just was like, cool, and put him in his freezer. And I was like, all right, you can have those. <laughs> that's a thing that exists. Yeah. Yeah, that's okay. Uh, he'll probably drink it way faster than I will. So he'll probably shout it out maybe at some point on something. I hope so. Fair. So, with all of that said, all the plugs out of the way for the Brutally Speaking podcast, I am John. And I am Dan. And we'll talk to you all next time.